Gracious and eternal God, Father, I pray once again this morning that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be now and always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Some of you may not be aware of this, but in the Anglican Church, we have a lectionary reading. So really, the readings for each particular Sunday are laid out for us, and there's different reasons for that. You'll have to ask Iris, she's studying about that as she, she's uh, doing her training. And uh, oftentimes, there are readings that we struggle with, and we try and say in our spirit, what is the Lord saying here? Or what sense do I make of this? And in preparing a sermon, you, you have to read, you have to study, there's, there's need for prayer. And uh, it takes a while to bring it all together. And this gospel reading for today is one of the most difficult, I think, for us. Uh, as clergy to preach on, but nevertheless, the Lord expects us to do just that. It's the parable of the clever steward. That's how some entitled it, and others have entitled it the parable of the dishonest manager. And as I've already said, it's uh, being considered one of the most difficult parables to, to preach on. And many commentators have tried to make sense of this particular parable. First, when we read it, uh, it can seem, the story itself can seem confusing, embarrassing, and certainly controversial. The parable opens with a rich man who hears accusations that his manager has been mismanaging the affairs of the estate. In other words, squandering his poverty, his property. The rich man believes the reports to be true, and so he calls his manager in, and he says, give an account of yourself. And then he gives him the dismissal. He fires him. The manager reflects on his new situation, of the crises that he finds himself in, and he thinks, about, well, what am I going to do now? Where am I going to go from here? I'm going to be unemployed, and I'm going to have no income. No hero to us. He admits being too weak to dig ditches for an honest day's pay, and too proud to beg. And so he hints on the idea of calling in his master's debtors so that he can reduce the total they owe. He calls them in one by one. Secrecy is part of his plan. He wants to buy their friendship, to use them for his own ulterior motive. After the transaction, you see, they are in his debt. He will gain their favor so that they will offer hospitality to him at the time of his becoming unemployed. As told by Jesus, however, the story ends with the boss surprisingly praising and not scolding the manager. The conclusion conflicts with our convictions concerning honesty and fairness. The crooked manager basked in the praise of his boss for sheer shrewdness and clever dishonesty. Somehow, we are supposed to derive some spiritual sense from all of this. Well, how shall we make sense of it? No, my friends, Jesus is not praising clever fraud. <coughs> He's not recommending that we buy friendship or suggesting that self-serving shrewdness or cleverness is a virtue. This parable does not praise self-interest or the buying of friends. That sounds crooked, diverging from Christ's teaching and ministry as told throughout the New Testament. As Christians, we 
we believe that friends cannot be bought. We believe that people are to be loved, appreciated, enjoyed, and as necessary, served. Somewhere in this passage, however, we must find the key to unlocking the treasure of its meaning for us. Perhaps it is here in the eighth verse. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Let's look carefully here. His dishonesty was not praised. His cheating was not commended. This was not a, not a compliment for a job well done. The master was not delighted to be cheated out of his rightful profits. But the manager was surely clever, surely energetic, and decisively responsible in handling the crisis of his future. That's what caught the attention of the owner and caused him to applaud his manager. Jesus hints the story right there and turns to his disciples to drive the point home to them. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light, verse 8b. As enthusiastic and ingenious as was the crooked man in the parable toward his own self-interest, so we are, as followers of Christ, we can be enthusiastic and energetic in our lives as children of God. I'm going to repeat that. As followers of Christ, we can be as enthusiastic and energetic in our lives as children of God. I knew a clergy in the United Church. Uh, as far as I know, she's still ministering in the United Church. It was in a wheelchair. Came to church every Sunday down through the aisle in her wheelchair. One of the most enthusiastic and energetic clergy persons I've ever met in my life. And every time I saw her, I used to think we could learn a lot from her. Because those of us who were able to get up and walk around do not often appreciate the good health and strength that the Lord gives us. Specifically in the parable of the crooked manager, Jesus seems to be making this point in reference to the use of money. Contrasting the resourcefulness of the dishonest steward or manager in a life of self-serving to Christ's call to us to live a life of self-giving. You ever hear of people in a community who just give and give and give of themselves? I have, and I'm sure you have too. In fact, I visited one such person this week, and the person right now needs help, but is finding it very difficult